there's a there's a little bit of an irony to this all fun ideas start on a piece of paper this one ended up remaining on paper That was really uh, what part of our inspiration is to think about a microscope that could literally be a dollar or less. People found that silly, uh, primarily because, of course, I said, oh, the right way to manufacture microscopes is out of paper. And that by itself was laughable. That was the grant that I wrote to the NSF. I was finally surprised that we were supported to pursue this idea of what I call print and fold optical instruments. When I started my lab, I spent some time in Thailand, India, South Asia, and experiencing and seeing the lack of capabilities that existed uh, for lab technicians across the globe. Once you don't have the tools, no matter how dedicated or passionate you are uh, in engaging with patients, you really cannot provide the best care. I remember being in Uganda uh, talking to a person who had been training malaria microscopists for the last uh, 40 years of his life. And he explicitly told me, Manu, you should come back to me when you can do diagnosis under a tree. Jim was a graduate student at that time, and I met him by a coincidence because he was looking for a lab to work in. You know, I think his background showed that he cared deeply about uh, people that I cared about, which is people that have very little. When I met with Manu, we talked about, um, I think, three different ideas that he had. And the one that really, uh, you know, caught my attention was related to making a, a low-cost, you know, version of a microscope using a ball lens. The same day that I met him, he just invited me to come in the lab and, you know, uh, just start playing around with different things to get started. You know, we just got some ball lenses. Your first thought of how to try to view something small through a ball lens is you just pick it up and you try to look. The first thing that goes wrong is that you end up poking yourself in the eye, right? Ultimately, where we made our big jump forward is when we found this source for black paper. It's a cardstock paper. The big step after that is really just to make the paper big enough so that it really gets your fingers out of the way of your eye. After that, it was just lots and lots of iterations and you know brainstorming about different features. A lot of people have told me I'm crazy. I think I do remember explicitly a time we wrote a paper, we figured out that it worked. The next day, Bill Gates tweeted about it. It's like, oh, a $1 microscope, interesting question mark. And it stuck with me. It's like, uh, why did he add a question mark? Up till now, we had built a hundred every time in batches, all done by hand. And then that day, the mission had changed. That tweet inspired me to flip that and said, we're gonna make 10,000. And it turned out we overshot. We made 75,000 of them. And so then we chose another harder problem, which is we're gonna make 100,000 of them. Then we made a million. And now at this very moment, we are actively thinking about how to manufacture 10 million of them. And at this point, we have made more number of microscopes than many 200 year old companies in this space, primarily because accessibility is at the heart of what we do. Everybody deserves the right to explore science, no matter what your background is. Most important work really has happened in the community, which remains independent from the commercial entity because the community is driven by the community of users. There was a guy in Seattle who heard about Fullscope and decided to quit what he was doing. And he biked from Laos to Cambodia to Thailand all across for the next year, running hundreds of Fullscope workshops. That's what he did. Everybody has an innate capacity to create knowledge. When you share something with them that you know, allows them to kind of see the same world they've always seen before, but in a new way, it's, it, it can be very exciting. True understanding of science comes from engaging in the process. 
and I very strongly feel we are just getting started. We truly have the capacity of bringing scientific literacy in a very physical way globally. At the time that this story began, I, I had already completed my first year of residency. A student from the engineering school was referred in for an accidental laser injury. Gerard agreed to take me in, sign me the, the project, which was studying laser-induced optical damage of optical material. I have been studying damage <laughs> with the material involuntarily. My, my eyeball became one of the, the, the test samples, <laughs> put it this way. Dital, you know, was working with this very short pulse laser. As he was working on this laser, by accident, he got, you know, uh, part of the beam in his eye. At the hospital, this intern examined Dita's eyes and he said, wow, that is amazing. When we dilated his eye, what I saw was a very small number of very precise, what we would call retinal burns in the very center of his retina. But these were unique in that they were very small and very precise. I was curious as to what kind of laser this was and learned what a femtosecond laser was. Donna and I have been working with my graduate students on a special kind of lasers, ultra short pulse laser mainly. We were really happy to get in 2018 the Nobel Prize for Physics. If you think about cutting the cornea of your eye or, or glass or anything transparent, the laser goes right through. And so this is why you couldn't cut something like glass or cornea with lasers before. And so I always describe it as building a laser hammer. It was not using absorption. We really just built a laser hammer to hammer those electrons right off the atoms. I started to consult for a small company down in San Diego, and they were developing short pass lasers for eye surgery. However, the technology what they were developing didn't have short enough passes. So it was working, but not really well working. There were some problems. At some point I lost hope because you keep improving and it doesn't work, you keep improving, it doesn't work, and then eventually I understood that with this particular technology there are some issues that cannot be overcome. So you know, there has to be some kind of a breakthrough technology coming to do this, to make this working, and, and that was femtoseconds. We conducted some basic experiments, you know, as a, a resident or a student, as soon as you have some results, you want to present those results. Detau and I actually attended a conference, uh, a scientific conference on lasers. Tibor was attending that conference as well. I met Ron on a scientific conference. Ron gave a talk about his findings with femtosecond laser passes and showing that everything what was a problem with picosecond can be overcome using femtoseconds. And then I joined the group working on the application of femtosecond lasers for eye surgery. When a person wants to reduce their requirement to use glasses, they can undergo uh, what's called vision correction surgery. And there were a number of procedures that were developed using manual tools, incisions, that provided some relief, but they came with some problems and complications. So there was a clinical need for precision that really led to our consideration of corneal surgery as being an appropriate place to look for femtosecond laser applications initially. With these lasers, we can achieve micron precision, which is very, very important. The other thing is the lack of collateral tissue damage. So we have to make sure that if you are cutting a tissue, we are cutting in the right place and we don't damage the adjacent tissue and the surrounding tissue. 
Nobody had ever developed a compact, reliable femtosecond laser prior to this. So the initial system that I was doing experiments with Daytau took an entire room. The laser systems that we that ultimately have been used are, you know, the size of a shoebox. So in the United States, most LASIK procedures now utilize the femtosecond laser. I've enjoyed, you know, over the last 20 years, just hearing people tell me I had uh, bladeless LASIK or I had intralase, which was the de specific device that we developed. As a physician, your professional pride comes from what you do specifically with particular patients on an individual basis, but you can never have an impact on, you know, millions of patients. Without the understanding of basic science, you, you could never develop technologies. You never know what is going to be an application. NSF funded Gerard. I don't think they, they had any idea that this will be an eye surgery product some years later and millions of people will get the surgery. We needed this money to make new, new, new lasers and also to do curiosity-driven research. That's important. There are many cases where accidental discoveries occur during researches, but this is the beauty of doing science. It's not completely predictable. But you can imagine, like any living organism, that's part of your everyday work, you develop a certain affection for it. The cone snails are interesting creatures. They are, like most snails, slow moving, but unlike most snails, they're venomous and they use their venoms to be able to immobilize prey. Our hope was that we would have some basic science impact. <laughs> it wasn't so clear that that would be attained and this was completely unexpected. We didn't start out with the idea of we're gonna research these cone snails and we're gonna come up with a pain medication. But as we got into it, there was this incredible gold mine of compounds. We didn't realize that, you know, we will have a whole life's work. So I grew up in the Philippines. I uh, was an only child, and my parents uh, moved to a home that was very isolated. I began collecting shells, maybe when I was about nine years old. That's how I became quite seriously uh, involved in, in shells. I got an offer to spend four to five months uh, in the U.S. And so it essentially was the fact that when I returned to the Philippines, we had to find something to do, which did not require any fancy equipment because we had none. Doing science in the Philippines at that time was quite difficult. And this is where we all agreed that Oh, we should work on something that we will have an advantage of. And, that, and then he suggested working on the cone snails because we have diversity of cone snails and we can easily get it. And so we began working with undergraduates and, and then they'd come up with their own good ideas. I went to Dr. Oliveira's laboratory, and I was fascinated by the work. So the project that I was assigned to, and that Craig Clark was assigned to, was to take different species of cone snail venom, purify them into their component parts, and determine their biological activity, and determine their chemical structure. There were a couple of breakthroughs. The first was the observation that some of the components in the venom, although they paralyzed fish, 
didn't paralyze animals. They acted on the nervous system, but not the muscle. What he and Michael found was that there was a very, very potent component that caused mice to shake in a very characteristic way, very abnormal shaking. By this time we knew that uh, all of these were a class of molecules called peptides. Michael purified all the omega conotoxins and that turned out to be extremely specific for only one type of calcium channel. And so it was an aha moment of this may be useful for blocking pain without causing paralysis. And what was so astounding was that this peptide that's used to paralyze fish has an application that can treat pain in a human. It was found to be a thousand times more potent than morphine, but importantly, it doesn't cause tolerance. It took a long, long time and for complicated reasons. So it didn't get approved until 2004. So that's how long it took. Federal funding has been an essential component of the research that we're doing. Wouldn't have happened without it. They didn't say, well, we're gonna give you this money and you've gotta come up with a drug. They said, do the exploratory science. We think this is interesting. And that incredible flexibility has really been supported by funding basic science. I think all of us are not the type that will be doing things according to the books all the time. Uh, follow your curiosity and doing it and you'll be surprised at what you end up with. In many ways, we were in the right place at the right time to be able to make these discoveries. Grateful for the team that we had to work with, but, but humble in realizing that in many ways it was a gift. Thank you.